Misha here. If you enjoy our episodes on career pathways in healthcare or the STEM field at large, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, the same team behind the acclaimed A16Z podcast. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with venture capital investors and A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. So whether you're interested in building a new digital healthcare company or your company is advancing a new novel medicine, Raising Health sheds light on some of the opportunities and obstacles along the founder's journey. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights, actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. A science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they... I it felt, felt, felt right. right. I was so and I just happy. thought, well... I figured it out. Wow. It was that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, welcome to The Story Clatter, where true personal stories about science help us to discover just how weird and wonderful it is to exist in this world and be a human. I'm your host, Misha Gajewski, and today's episode is about those rare but serendipitous full circle moments. We only thought they happened in movies, but nope, real people can experience them too, like our first storyteller, Gregor Posadas. Gregor is an engineering graduate research assistant at Boise State University. His story was recorded in Boise as part of a special show we did in partnership with Boise State University and the Center for Advanced Energy Studies, featuring personal stories from veterans and service members in STEM. I love Gregor's story so much, and I know you're going to, too. It's such a heartwarming example of tenacity and never giving up on your dreams. Here's Gregor. Twenty nineteen, I had to put a pause on my high school studies in the Philippines to move seven thousand and something miles to the amazing city of Boise, and the future seemed very uncertain. The only thing I was sure of was that I wanted to be a civil engineer. See, when I grew up, my father, who was a physicist and a professor, had urged me very early on to pursue a degree in engineering. I think I told him once that I wanted to be a painter. And oh my God, the look of disgust and disdain and disappointment on his face. He was effectively telling me that, oh my gosh, you wanna be a painter, you're gonna retire homeless. But fair enough. So from that little anecdote, from, from that point onwards, I was very blatantly urged by my parents to pursue a career in civil engineering. Now, that may seem very appalling. I mean, forcing your kid to do to pursue a future that he didn't choose. But to their credit, I did, I did like playing with Legos and Minecraft, and yes, I am from that generation. But on the other hand, my dad had told me that engineering could help fix our country, the Philippines. Whenever there was a bump on the road that our car would hit, or we, get, we would get a notification in the mail saying that there's gonna be a water shut off, or if there was news of failing infrastructure in the country, my parents would give me this look effectively saying, please, oh God, study hard so you can fix the country. And so that was the type of family that I grew up in. But the other thing that you should know about my family is that my family was poor. Even though my dad was a professor, he wasn't making much. And so when he passed away in 2017, the only inheritance he had left us was my inspiration to become an engineer. My mother, a widowed housewife with no job and two young kids to raise, had decided that it would be in our best interest to move to America. And I was very much against it. I mean, I had grown up with the notion that my future would lie in helping our country, but how on earth could I help our country if I wasn't in it in the first place? And so very heated arguments were exchanged between my 16-year-old self and my mother and the very fact that I'm talking to you right now here at Boise State University should very clearly tell you who won those arguments. <laughs> and so, so we moved. And in 2019, 
I transferred to some random high school here in Boise. And I'm not going to lie, I was very much a loner in between the cultural differences between high school in the Philippines and here in America. And the fact that I was an introvert, it was very hard to me to find friends. And so I had decided that up until I graduated high school, all I, all I would do was study. And that's what I did. I studied and studied and studied all the way up to graduation. Graduation came, next stop, university. At the time, my mother was working as a grocer at the local Winco downtown, and her job was to stock up cereal boxes up on the store shelves. And that was the only source of income our family had. And so when I told her that I wanted to go to university, she had very gently told me that we just couldn't afford it. And I was very upset. Now, granted, I could have looked for a job, but remember, I had only been five months into this country. I had no car, no direct deposit. Heck, I didn't even know what direct deposit was. I didn't have my citizenship, and I didn't have my social security, so I, the cards were pretty much stacked up against me. My mother, one day, she sits me down. She had just gotten home from her groceries, and she hands me this brochure, and in bold letters it said, Go Army. And she, she told me with a smile, she was like, they'll help pay for your college. And I was like, woman, whoa, 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 whoa. I have only been in this country for five months and you, want, you now want me to serve in the country or in the army of a country that I barely know. And she was like, yeah. <laughs> of course, I was against it, but like most arguments with my mother, this one saw me sitting down at the West Franklin Road Army Recruiting Station. And I told the recruiter, yeah, I'm, I want to enlist so that I can go to college and get my civil engineering degree. And my recruiter, who funnily enough was also Filipino, they told me, oh, oh, civil engineer. You see this? Combat engineer. I mean, it's practically the same thing. And I was like, I mean, I was 17 at the time. I didn't know any better. So I was like, you know, that sounds like a good idea. I'll sign up to be a combat engineer in the United States Army. And to the veterans and service members out here, you'll know very well that I had just made a crucial mistake. Little did I know that combat engineers were supposed to be in the front lines of whatever. But there I was. And it, by the time I realized the mistake that I had made, it was too late. Come January of 2020, a year after I had moved here to America, my shaved head and I were undergoing basic combat training in Fort Leonard Wood, Fort, Fort Lost in the Woods, for the more familiar of you, in Missouri. And in between the countless miles that we rocked and the yelling from the drill sergeants to do push-ups, I had to constantly remind myself that this was all so that I could be a civil engineer. Effectively, at some point I realized that I had to learn how to serve this country so that I could effectively help my country in the future. And so come April of 2020, I was done with training. I got back to Idaho, and I was pretty much set to go to college, thanks to the tuition assistance and the GI Bill. But it didn't pay for everything, so I had to do a bunch of random odd jobs on campus. At some point, I was a barista, a graphic designer, a dispatcher. Um, I don't know what the heck I was doing as a video game tester, but there I was. Um, I was also an IT specialist, telling people to turn on and off their computers, and there I was, doing all these random jobs and having to constantly remind myself that this was all so that I could be a civil engineer. But just as the Army had put me into school, it was also the very reason why I had to take a break from it. In 2022, I had to go to the National Training Center at Fort Irwin, California to undergo a month-long training event, which would effectively pull me out of school for a li little bit. And during that time, in between the random sandstorms and the flash floods that would occur in the middle of a desert, and the countless miles of concertina wire that I had to help pick it pound into the ground, I had an epiphany. I do not want to be doing this for the rest of my life. And I sort of started thinking, okay, what's, what's the next rational step? I mean, I'm a civil engineer student. How do I get to becoming a civil engineer? And so I realized that I needed to get an internship. And so that was my biggest goal for 2022, get an internship, get a civil engineer internship. That was the only thing I had set my mind to. And as soon as I got back to Idaho from that training, I wasn't in school, so I couldn't do any of those random ass student jobs that I had mentioned earlier. So I had to get a dead-end night shift office job, which was a 4.30 p.m. to a 1.30 a.m. type of deal. 
And I hated that job. I dreaded going to that job every, every evening. And so every time I would get home from that job, I would spend the next two months just applying to at least five internships a day. It didn't matter if it was in-state, out-of-state, Nampa, Meridian, wherever the heck it was, I would apply for it. And I remember out of all the internships that I had applied for, none of them would hire me. Only three of them, three of them in town had responded to my application saying, hey, uh, we want to do an interview with you. And so I went to those interviews in random cities here in Idaho, and all of them would come back with a response saying that we had found a more qualified candidate. And so in between the rejection and my homesickness, I was pretty much just, I was pretty much out of it. And so I decided with what little money I had left, you know what, I am going to go fly back to the Philippines. I cannot be dealing with this right now. I'm on the verge of giving up on my future in engineering, and I just can't. So I flew back home. And during my self-imposed Thanksgiving break in the Philippines, I had gotten an email from this company named Stantec, which I would later on find out was one of the world's biggest water infrastructure design firms. And I was surprised because I was thinking, OK, look, none of these local companies would hire me. But this huge international firm wants to take, take me under their wing? That sounds insane, but I bit the bullet. And they had scheduled an interview with me at 1.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Now, I say that very specifically because, mind you, I was still in the Philippines. So come the day of the interview, these random engineers who I had never met started pouring into the Zoom call. And one of them asked, uh, uh, Gregor, uh, why, is your, why is your window so dark? And I had told them, I, to be frank, it's 4.30 in the morning here in the Philippines. And they were all pretty shocked. But at the same time, they commended me for still being able to make it to the interview. And we went on with the usual interview procedure. I had told them that, oh, the closest thing I had to engineering experience was my experience as a combat engineer. And I will tell you very, right now that it's very difficult to justify how blasting doors open and shooting guns is related to uh, designing a wastewater plant. But the interview, the interview stopped. We all went our separate ways. And I flew back home to Boise feeling very anxious because I wasn't sure if I, if I had a job waiting for me. And so three weeks after I had gotten back to Boise, I get another email. Again, it was Stantec telling me that they wanted to do a breakfast interview with me. And I was like, the first thought in my head was like, okay, geez, how many interviews do these guys want? But the next thing was that, okay, okay, this is my in. And so come the day of the interview, it was at this local diner, and I remember the engineers who did the breakfast interview with me had treated me to a quesadilla, and that was the first time in my life that I ever had a quesadilla, so there were a lot of monumental things going on on that day. <laughs> but we went on with the normal interview procedure, and they asked me how my trip was, what my plans for the future were, and that was that. And we had all left the diner doors, ready to go to our cars and go our separate ways. But then the senior principal engineer, who was part of the interview, stopped me and he asked me, uh, Gregor, uh, who are we in competition with? Effectively asking me who else I had applied for. And I, and I stopped for a moment and I, and I, and I said, uh, uh, no one. I mean, the only company I'm talking to right now is yours. And he gave me this very confused look. I was like, oh, OK, well, good luck to you then. And so. We, uh, we all went our separate ways. I went back to my car. But as soon as I sat down on the driver's seat, I had just realized how stupid my response was. The only thing, thinking, the, the only thing I was thinking at that time was that, Jesus Christ, now they're going to think I'm desperate, that no one else is willing to hire me. I was so disappointed in myself. And on the drive home, I was disappointed. That, that night, I was disappointed. I woke up, I was disappointed. I think for breakfast, I had applied for five internships because I was ready to get that rejection notice from them. But then come the afternoon of that day, my phone buzzes. I look at it, it's a Gmail preview. It says, Stantec, offer of position. And before I could open that email, I get this phone call. It was one of the engineers who had interviewed me. I answer it, and he was like, 
hey, Gregor, uh, I just wanted to say congratulations. I'm sure you've read the email. I'm like, oh, okay, no, you've only, it's only been two seconds since I've seen it, but he just wanted to say congratulations because they wanted to move forward with my application. And at that point, at that point, I was hired. That was the first ever civil engineering job I had ever gotten, and I was so proud. The effort that it took to get to that very point and an internship doesn't seem like such a significant thing, but to me, it was huge. The effort that it took to get to that very point didn't start with me handing them my resume over LinkedIn. It started with me reluctantly moving to the United States, transferring into some random high school that I wasn't familiar with, joining the military, taking on these odd jobs, and going through random sandstorms and picket pounding in the desert. It took all that effort for me to get to that very point where I was hired. After that phone call with one of the engineers who would later on be my supervisor for my internship, I immediately called my mom. And in Tagalog, I told her, Ma, natanggap ako, which means in English, Mom, I got hired. And she was so happy. She said, Oh, salamat sa Diyos, which means thank God. And I'm like, okay, God didn't do any of the effort I did. But, <laughs> but she was so happy because this was the plan. This was the whole reason why she had brought her two young kids to America, this very moment where I got hired. My future seemed a little brighter. And, the, and the, here I am talking to you guys about how I got my first internship. On top of my internship experience, I'm also now, as you guys heard earlier, a research assistant under the civil engineering department, where I get to learn a lot about wastewater. Just last week, I was at a wastewater plant, so I'd like to thank everyone in this audience for helping contribute to my research. <laughs> if you understood that joke, that's disgusting. But here I am, one month away from graduation for my civil engineering degree. And the only thing I had brought with me throughout this entire journey, even when the path didn't seem so straightforward, was a dream of helping my people through engineering. Those, those bumps in the road, those water shortage notifications, that, those failing infrastructures that would show up on the news that my, that my father would complain about when, when he was still alive. <sighs> My hope for the future is that I may one day go, up, go back home to my country and pretty much put my money where my mouth is and help fix those problems. See, at many points throughout this journey, I could have given up. But as the saying goes, you can kill the dreamer, but you can't kill the dream. Thank you all for your time. <laughs> That was Gregor. To learn more about him, visit our website, storyclatter.org. Being a storyteller on our stage is just one way to make Story Collider happen, but if standing alone in the spotlight in front of an audience doesn't speak to you, maybe becoming a Story Collider donor might be more your speed. Story Collider donors play a vital role in our ability to bring you this podcast. We're in this together. Story Collider is one big experiment that's designed to connect us around our love of discovery, curiosity, and the natural world. If you believe in the power of these stories and this mission, please donate to the Story Clatter at storyclatter.org slash donate. The most popular level is $10 a month, and you can make your tax-deductible donation at storyclatter.org slash donate. But really, any level makes a difference, and we're so grateful to everyone who supports Story Collider. Our next story is from Nandu Balakrishnan. Nandu is the Director of Microbiology at Georgia Public Health Laboratory. His story was recorded at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta as part of an event we did with the Association of Public Health Laboratories in 2023. This story is an incredible example of altruism and how being kind to a stranger can totally change your life. I can't wait for you to hear this story. Here's Nandu. I was born and raised in a smaller, beautiful village in southern India. I lost my father when I was six years old. I still could not able to remember how my father looks like. 
I still have this pain inside me. And during those childhood days, when I go to school and see other kids in my age, it, my heart was broken. So I always ask this question inside me, how a true father it really is. It has never been full fault. One day, definitely I'll meet my dad. So on the other hand, my mother was a source of my inspiration. She instilled the motivation in me and she showed me the willpower that even I can be successful in this world. My mother worked in my village and she worked for a daily wages. She makes sure that we have food on the table. Most importantly, we struggle a lot financially. And for example, my first pair of shoes my mother bought was after, my, after graduating my 12th standard back in India. So literally for my education and my sister's education, my mother decided, okay, let's move out of this village and go to a big, big, bigger city. So we moved out of our village and then my passion was always go to med school. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a surgeon. And fortunately, because of my financial commitments that I can able to go to med school. However, by God's grace, I got a full scholarship in one of the premier institutions in India where I could pursue my master's in medical microbiology. After my graduation, I started working as a microbiologist and also I just want to do a PhD. So because of my, my family situation and financial expenses and I couldn't able to continue my PhD immediately. So I was working at the hospital as a microbiologist so I could save some money for my family expenses and for my PhD education as well. So luckily I got a full scholarship again to pursue my PhD in medical microbiology, one of the premier institutions. So I started my PhD. I was at the hospital. I was at the blood culture bench. I received a call one day morning from a cardiothoracic emergency department. So we have a patient. Uh, so chief asked me to call you because this could be one of the potential case for your PhD. So I said, okay, that's great. So I just went up there. The patient was gravely ill. He underwent a valve replacement surgery in the same hospital. And he was very toxic and his blood counts were all over. His kidneys were shutting down. What I did was, so they asked me, so do you want to do a blood culture? Absolutely. So I sat with the patient, I drew the blood culture and I went back to the laboratory. Next day, the blood all three sets came out positive and we did the gram stain. So it was a gram negative pleomorphic cocobacilli. Subsequently, the culture grew multi-drug resistant as an interbacter Baumannia complex, which was susceptible only to one drug, imipenum. I took the report to the hospital and we're doing a rounds. So I gave it to the attending he looked at the report. All he said, unfortunately, I do not have this drug in the pharmacy. So all I know at the time is that this patient is going to die if we don't treat this patient. And immediately the attending physician told directly to the patient, if you don't get this drug from the outside pharmacy, you're going to die. This guy was a 26 year old farmer in a village. And then he was crying and sobbing. He has his wife and she was holding a six month old baby in her hands. He, he don't know what to do. The cost of the drug imipenum 
back on those days was $25, which was equivalent to close to 2,000 Indian rupees. That was just a one quarter of his monthly wages. He was crying and sobbing and I do not know what to do. After that, he asked me, do you have a minute? I just want to talk to you. I said, sure, why not? I just pulled a chair and I sat next to him. He was holding my hands. All he said was, I already have so much debts in my life. I don't have this money to purchase the drug. I don't want to take additional debts on my shoulders. I would rather die. He started sobbing and again, the wife started crying. At that moment, I do not know what to do. I just went home. On the same night, it's me, my mother, my sister, and my grandmother. We, we all are having a dinner. So my mother was my father, mother, mentor, coach, and she's everything to me. I started sharing about this farmer. And then she started talking about my father. She said, I did not really tell both of you to me and my sister what happened to your father. He was gravely ill. Nobody came forward to financially support my mother, including my own family. If I had that money with me, I could have taken your father to a good hospital where I could have saved my husband and I've given you father's love, what it is. It was so painful for me. And all she said was, I will let you to decide what you want to do. And my grandmother was also there. My father was the only son to my grandmother. I know how painful it was to losing her only son, seeing me and my sister and my mother going through all these pains in our childhood. And all she said was, no, at least you have some savings that you can do this to this family and you can save this person so he can be a husband and he can be a father. I don't want any child to go through the pain that you have gone through in your childhood. It was just resonating in my ears. I couldn't be able to sleep. I could see myself in the six months old baby. And I could see my mother in his wife's eyes that the pain that she's going to go through, that my mother has gone through during my childhood. So next morning, I went to my bank. I pulled some of my savings that, that I saved for my education and for my family expenses. All I did was I took that money, I gave it to his wife, just go purchase the drug. She purchased the amipenum drug and they've started the IV infusion immediately. You can see his blood cell count was dropping off. His blood urea, nitrogen, and creatinine was going down. And finally, I also connected them with the nonprofit organization where they could get some additional monetary support for the rest of their expenses at the hospital. The farmer was completely all right. He left home with his wife and the six month old baby. The six month old baby was now a 19 year old son who was doing an engineering. And even though his father was an uneducated person, he could able to give a best education for his son. And every time when I visit India, 
I visit this family to make sure they are doing okay. And this is my first patient during my PhD. And this has turned my life of who I am right now. And most importantly, I've lost a lot of patients during my PhD period. We had a lot of cases who died with a poor surgical complications for the valve replacement. But this patient was such a momentum in my life, resonating my life in the past, in the childhood that he has gone through it. So we, my family, my mother and my, actually I could not even able to remember how my father looks like. All I remember is just seeing his picture. So we buried our father in my hometown in his own farm and we planted a neem tree. It, it was a big tree now. It was almost 25 years now since I lost my father. Whenever I visit India, myself, my mother, and my sister, we go to our hometown and we cherish our moments under the neem tree. Myself and my sister still owe a lot to my mother for the sacrifices that she has made for me and my sister. That has meant a lot to me. Even though my passion is I just want to be a doctor, but the drive and the motivation and the positive spirit she gave on to me have chosen this tra trajectory as a microbiologist and a public health scientist. And I continue my passion in saving lives. At the end of the day, behind the scenes, each and every one of the laboratory professional brings so much to the table. It does mean a lot. Even though this pandemic has been challenging for a lot of people, so many of them have lost their loved ones. But still, you all bring the positive motivation and drive the ship and each and every day, each and every one of you are saving lives behind the scenes. Thank you. That was Nandu. If you'd like to learn more about him, visit our website, storyclatter.org. Our website is just one way to connect with Story Collider, but there are so many other ways, and we hope you'll use them all. You can always follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Head to storycollider.org to become a financial supporter. Or if you want to come to one of our shows, start your own Story Collider show in your community, or even learn how to tell your own science story, you can learn all about that on our website too. This podcast is produced by me, Misha Gajewski, along with Nikisha Roberts-Washington, Jen Chen, and Aaron Barker executive director and co-founder of The Story Collider. The stories featured in today's episode were produced by Nikisha Roberts-Washington, Jitesh Jaggi, Mesa Salida, and Emma Yarbrough. Special thanks goes out to Story Collider's board and staff, including Anne-Marie Lonsdale, Leslie Burnson, and Lindsay Cooper. Our theme music is by Ghost, and next week, get ready for some wild stories all about staring death in the face. They're so good, and I can't wait for you to hear them. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.